I'm Mark Updegrove, and on behalf of our partners on tonight's program, the LBJ School of Public Affairs and the Annette Strauss Center for Civic Life, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this evening's program, an evening with California Governor Jerry Brown. Before we get to our program, I just have a couple of bits of housekeeping. First, I want to thank our sponsors, St. David's Healthcare, the Ford Foundation, the Moody Foundation, and Tito's Handmade Vodka. I always say, I always say homemade vodka and the word hand is this big on the page tonight. Tito's homemade vodka. Uh, and second, uh, for our friends at the LBJ Library, please join us on Wednesday, December 5th, as renowned author and NBC presidential historian Michael Beschloss joins us to talk about his new best-selling book, Presidents of War. Uh, it's, it's worth a read, and it's certainly going to be worth coming to the program. If you're not a friend of the LBJ Library, please consider becoming one. You'll enjoy stellar programming like that that you will see tonight. Tonight, we are delighted to have with us the outgoing governor of California, Jerry Brown, who I will have the privilege of interviewing. Introducing our honored guest is Cappy McGar, a founding co-chair of the Annette Strauss Center, a trustee of the LBJ Foundation, and a good friend of this library and this university. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cappy McGar. Thank you, Mark. We are here today after an historic election, and I think we all have our fingers on the pulse this evening because we all know what you want, more politics. <laughs> I know that the hopes of many Democrats were riding, uh, were, were riding on an upset here in the Lone Star State, but political gravity has a habit of pulling us back to reality. Losses are sobering, but they present lessons to be learned, and especially for the idealist hoping for change. Tonight, we'll have the opportunity to learn from a leader who has landed th that fair share. I'm a proud alumnus of UT, and having graduated just over 40 years ago, all the way back when Texas was blue, and California had a governor named Jerry Brown. <laughs> Along with the LBJ Library this evening, we're so fortunate to have two great Longhorn institutions named after two great visionary leaders who have joined forces to host a conversation with another great American visionary. Many thanks to Susan Knoll, the director of the Annette Strauss Institute. And just full disclosure, Annette Strauss was my mother-in-law, and so uh, I'm trying to impress her every day. Dean Angela Evans of the LBJ School and the LBJ Foundation led by the able leadership of our chair, Larry Temple. And a very special thanks to Walter Robb, a co-founder and former CEO of Whole Foods. He goes all around the world spreading the word of healthy evening, and quite frankly, I'm sick of hearing him talk about it. <laughs> but he talks about leadership, integrity in the boardroom, and the reason that Governor Brown is here with us today is Walter Roberts. So Walter, thank you very much. Tonight's conversation is sure to be illuminating. Throughout his career, Governor Brown has demonstrated the knack for governing in rather unusual times. In 1965, Ronald Reagan was governor of California. In 2011, he succeeded Arnold Schwarzenegger. So for all the Democrats out there, this is someone who knows how to take over from, and dare I say, clean up after a celebrity Republican executive. <laughs> like the Brown family, Governor Brown has devoted his life to public service. From the Los Angeles Community College Board of Trustees, to California Secretary of State, to Governor, to Mayor of Oakland, to State Attorney General, and Governor once more, all in that order. He's a leader who, in every office he's held, has used the position he has to make the world a better place. California has changed a lot since Governor Brown took office. For starters, there's much less avocado toast then. <laughs> His fiscal leadership has been without equal, and today California is the fifth largest economy in the world. As a Texan, it pains me to point out that 
Ours is 10th. So I guess everything is not bigger than Texas. When he demonstrated that economic growth and environmental stewardship can go hand in hand. In September, the governor pledged to launch his, quote, own damn, end quote, satellite in response to Trump's administration inaction on climate change. In his career, earliest career, Governor Brown was nicknamed Governor Moonbeam for his idealism. You know, I gotta say, Governor Moonbeam and versus President Space Force? <laughs> Sounds like a Marvel movie I'd go see. But to be serious for a moment, it speaks miles about a man's character to have identified a passion so early in his career and stick with it and build on his ambition 10 times over. It brings to mind something that LBJ said about a meaningful progress during a speech he gave at Woodrow Wilson School of Public Affairs in 1966. And if you'll pardon me, I will say what President Johnson said. It is not something to be discovered suddenly. <laughs> it must be built step by painful, patient step and the building will take the best work of the world's best men and women. Governor Brown embodies that commitment. And his lifetime of service speaks so much more than a single issue. It speaks to the devotion of his values and alliance to this state, his state. That's what public service is all about. Please welcome the governor of the great state of California, Jerry Brown, and the president of the LBJ Foundation again, Mark Updegrove. Governor, that uh, standing ovation is not just Texas hospitality. That's well earned. Uh, we're honored to have you here. Uh, we, uh, we are now uh, a day in, uh, into the, uh, the, the midterm election results. Um, can we start by talking about your, your thoughts about what transpired yesterday? Well, uh, what transpired is what is, and, and is, uh, it reflects the fragmentation uh, the real differences that exist all across the country. So the fact that now one house is controlled by the Republicans, one by the Democrats, uh, it's emblematic of what's happening to democracies throughout the world. Uh, whether you look at uh, Germany or even France or England with the Brexit, uh, if you look at places where democracy is under severe attack by authoritarians, like in Brazil, uh, or in the Philippines, and in a different way in Hungary and, and Poland, where the uh, forces of, of uh, diversity and, and democratic check and balance is being eroded. Uh, we're in a very turbulent time, uh, driven by uh, disruptions in the economy because of the rapidity of new technologies, uh, cultural norms uh, being um, expressed in so many different ways. Uh, by different people. So you put all this together and there's no overarching theme. And I'd say that's what, uh, yes, there's some discontent uh, with the president, but there's a lot of uh, content with the president, depending upon which district or which state you're in. So I think it's a very yeasty time and I hope uh, things don't go downhill. Is, is it reminiscent of any other time that you've seen in your life as a public servant? Well, I remember uh, Harry Truman was out in California, I think it was around 19, early 60, and he was visiting my father, who was the governor of California. And he said to my father, who was called Pat, he said, Pat, this is the most divisive time uh, in American history since the Civil War. And I didn't think it was all that divisive, but I think uh, President Truman saw the civil rights um, emergence and saw what that was gonna do by way of division. So I'd say we're right at that spot again, although now it's not just a question of black and white. Uh, it's a lot of differences, many different um, lifestyle, uh, religion, politics, 
worldview. Uh, there's a lot, uh, the, the, the population is segmenting. And I know uh, from a political point of view, the technical response is big data, micro-targeting, uh, telling each little subgroup uh, what they like to hear in order for them to feel more favorably about you. So that doesn't add uh, to uh, e pluribus unum. We're kind of going the other way. We're going uh, from unum, or if we had much, we had a certain amount of unum, oneness. <laughs> now we're going to plurality, uh, or whether you call it diversity or multiculturalism or anything else. That's just where we are. So I think we do need unifying themes, but you can't unify uh, by just trying to prop up what is no longer sustainable. So it's, um, uh, and with all the channels, people tune into Fox, they tune into MSNBC, and on the, the and I don't know how closely you watch this, but from a campaign consultant's point of view, people really uh, are pinpointed. And you can send uh, text messages, emails, uh, direct mail, not so much direct mail anymore. Even, even on the television, uh, the way they can, they can map out who are the Democrats, who are the Republicans, uh, who owns gu who are registered gun owners, uh, do you own a pickup truck or do you own a Prius? And based on that, you'll get a different message. And uh, instead of a great public debate, uh, the exercise is to reconfirm the subjectivity of each subgroup, each subset, each demographic. And so that then reinforces and um, extenuate and uh, exacerbates the fragmentation. So uh, what I would say, I mean, California, we had some, from the Democratic point of view, we had some good victories. Um, we passed, uh, a, well, we didn't pass, we defeated a measure that was supported by uh, the Speaker uh, and our Majority Leader, Mr. McCarthy, from California and they put on a measure to uh, eliminate a gas tax that the legislature by two thirds voted, voted for. And that measure was defeated by 10 points. So I'd say that's saying something that people are willing to invest in roads and bridges, in buses and trains and transit. Uh, and, and I think that's a big thing. So there's a lot of things that happen. I don't like to make a generalization because so many Places are so different, and certainly California is going to be different than Texas, but even Texas is different than Texas 10 years ago, mm. and California is different. Um, California, when Pete Wilson ran for governor, he ran against my sister, as a matter of fact, and there was a ballot measure to um, exclude uh, undocumented families and their children from health care and from uh, public schools, and that passed very strongly, and Pete Wilson won, but in the succeeding decades, uh, the Republicans have shrunk to 24% of the vote, going down from uh, uh, above 40. Yeah, and um, <laughs> so that was a, but I only list that just to give you a little history of California, but also uh, the instability, the change. The, there, there's lots of change going on, and some of it, you can't stop it. You can channel it maybe or respond to it. So I would say the election, uh, you have to look at different places, derive different uh, conclusions from uh, different states. For example, California, uh, by 10 points, uh, decided to keep a recently enacted 12 cent gas tax and 20 cent tax uh, on diesel. Okay, a lot of people voted against that, by the way, but not enough. In, in Washington, uh, there was a carbon tax uh, on the ballot. It was defeated by about the same margin. Now, in those case, the oil companies um, spent uh, two to one, uh, or more than that, overwhelmed the, the pro-carbon tax people. Now, luckily, uh, on my little vote on no, uh, we outspent our opponents about 40 million to four million. And that's the way I like it. I like a silent opposition. <laughs> You've heard of the silent minority. That's what I like, a silent minority. While we are the, were the louder, better financed. <laughs> Uh, but, of course, we had public sector unions, we had the Republican Chamber of Commerce, uh, we had businesses, engineering firms, the Caterpillar gave several hundred thousand dollars because they're all engaged in this, what it was all about was a 5.2 billion forever cash flow 
building roads and bridges and overpasses. Mm -hmm. And that's public safety, that's efficiency, that's, that's investment. So that's something you can learn from. Now you want to go to Washington, a state of Washington, they say no on a carbon tax. Carbon taxes, um, a price of carbon, most people think you got to have that. Um, Paulson, Hank Paulson, uh, Republican, George Schultz, former ambassador, they all agree with that. So uh, there's a lot to be learned. Some of it's uh, who put on the better campaign, who had the most money, uh, but it's also different moods and feelings. Pol a lot of uh, politics isn't just action, it's reaction. And that's why you, know, you get Clinton and then you get Bush, and then you get Bush and then you get Obama. Then you get Obama and you get Trump. So now what do we get after Trump? That's a good question. But generally, you don't get the same thing. And I've had the experience that I followed Ronald Reagan in 1975, uh, Republican, movie actor. And then in 2010, I followed Arnold Schwarzenegger, Republican and movie actor. So <laughs> I've honed the skill of, <laughs> of following movie actors. And I must say, I do pay attention. Because the... the um, Warren Beatty once told me, said he was at the White House watching Reds, screening Reds for Ronald Reagan. And during the intermission, Ronald Reagan got up and said to him, oh, Warren, I can't imagine how someone could run for president if they haven't first been a movie star. <laughs> Just a little inside advice, you won't hear it again, uh, but there it is. So the big issue, fragmentation, turbulence, danger, but also opportunity. That was Did you see saying. yesterday's verdict as, as a, uh, a knock against Trumpism? It, where it was knocked, he was definitely knocked in many places, but not in Indiana, not in whatever the other places, not here in Texas. And so yeah, it's a knock. That's why I say it's not one thing. Mm -hmm. There is intense um, antagonism uh, to Donald Trump, and there's intense loyalty. So that's... That's what makes for a very difficult, uh, uh, very difficult political environment. We, we have to pull together, and that only comes with a vision and something people can buy into. But if you have, have you're totally red and the other one's totally blue, it takes a very skillful politician. And basically, what the tendency is to look for victims or look for enemies, adversaries, um, fears. And uh, how do you unify? Well, if you can get a common danger, a common enemy. So it is a, it's a dangerous time. We've known in history how these things can turn out. So um, Trump is part of the problem, in my view, because I have a different view of how things should work, and I can go into that. Uh, but I think what's interesting is that Trump enjoys the level of support that he does. Mm -hmm. What does that say about how people feel about those things that he is fighting against. And some of the things he's fighting against, I'm fighting for. So there you go. You ran for president in 1976, 1980, and 1992. Yeah. Do you see any... Oh, by the way, I only got one delegate in 1980, so that was, that was rather <laughs> pathetic. <laughs> but I did, every time you run for president, it's, a, it's like a seminar in uh, national, domestic, and foreign policy. So I always had a chance to think like a president as long as I was running. So you'd learn a lot. I did learn a lot. Do you see uh, any Democrat emerging from the pack of, of new victors who might be made of presidential well, timber? I can't, I don't know. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, quite a group. And you have some of the older, the older folk who are younger than I am, by the way, Joe Biden and John Kerry, they're floating around. And there's Bernie. And then you have a bunch of them. We even have a couple from California. So it, at this stage, it's, it reminds me of the Republican primary, when you had all those people. Hmm. They all had to raise their hand, or whatever the heck they did. Um, and <laughs> Trump was able to emerge, so who knows? Uh, Maybe there'll be some Democrat you don't know about. It's probably in the group that we're now talking about. Yeah. The, uh, uh, in this state, uh, one of the, the candidates on the losing end was, was uh, Beto O'Rourke. Beto O'Rourke, the young, charismatic, uh, dynamic, uh, senatorial candidate who uh, looks a whole lot like Jerry Brown did in, in the uh, mid-1970s. Uh, Newsweek, in their uh, uh, version, their, their uh, uh, post this morning, had the headline, Beto O'Rourke could be America's next president. Do you think that's possible? 
Well, I didn't watch this campaign. I've, I've read a couple of stories and they sounded very exciting, but can you take a unsuccessful campaign and turn it into a successful? Well, I can think of one big advantage. When you lose, you have a lot of time. <laughs> you don't have anything to, to occupy you. These incumbents, uh, particularly from the West, have to get on an airplane and travel all the way to New Hampshire. It's five hours. Uh, so if you don't have a job, you can get right out there <laughs> and start stirring it up. And who knows? Anything's possible. Look, Trump won the nomination with less money, with no previous political experience, with most, I'd say, 95% of all political analysts and pundits uh, thinking he had no chance. Mm -hmm. So uh, today, it's what you look like on television, uh, what significant people might say about you. Even Trump proved you don't even need significant people to say anything nice about you. <laughs> you can, so it's, it's open. And if you can stand there with the other pack, four people, five people, seven people, and somehow in that give and take, you impress some people, then you raise some money, then you take out some ads, pretty soon you're on your way. So no, I wouldn't write them off. If, if you were president, what would you put at the top of your agenda? If I were president, mm -hmm. uh, unquestionably I'd put uh, nuclear arms negotiations with, with Russia. Uh, at any moment, this civilization can be annihilated. Not by, necessarily by intention, but by blunder. There have been several times where both the Russians thought we had launched hundreds of missiles to attack Russia, and when there have been times, for example, when William Perry, as Secretary of Defense, was woke up in the middle of the night and uh, he was told by the uh, Strategic Air Command uh, that uh, incoming missiles, nuclear missiles, were coming from Russia. Both were mistakes. Mm. Uh, it, those were periods where we were having good conversations and relations. Now, the, the tensions, the hostilities, the name calling is such that maybe we wouldn't have that kind of pause or that kind of confidence to say, wait a minute, uh, let's wait. Because you know, if you're wrong, then you're supposed to uh, uh, respond very quickly if there's an attack. So I'd say uh, that if the INF, George Bush, uh, tore up the uh, anti-ballistic missile treaty, uh, which had been crafted by Richard Nixon, and then uh, the INF treaty crafted by Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev is being threatened. Mm. And then after that, there's the New START treaty. And uh, that it might be that in another year, uh, there will be no nuclear treaties between Russia and the United States, no formalized channel of communication, which would be the first time uh, since President Kennedy uh, made the agreement with the Russians to stop uh, atmospheric uh, testing in, in, in the external environment. So it's very dangerous. I would say very few people are talking about it because um, the end of the, I'm sorry to report, but the end of the world is not news. <laughs> Tweets are news. <laughs> One tweet is equal to at least 200 incoming missiles before they happen. Because before they happen, there's nothing to report. So what we do have to report is the breakdown in communications, and now uh, it's never been this bad. And we had uh, the Cold War, and Richard Nixon and uh, Henry Kissinger went over to the Kremlin. They had de Brezhnev, not a, not a nice fellow, as far as we know from his history. Yeah. And actually, Pat Nixon and Richard spent a couple of nights in the Kremlin. And Kissinger and Nixon stayed up late in the night, and they came up with detente, and that led uh, to SALT-1, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, okay? And then Reagan came along and all of a sudden Nixon's impeached and Henry Kissinger loses his popularity. He went from Super K to the Lone Ranger and uh, uh, Reagan came along and warned about the evil empire and the uh, window of vulnerability. And then all of a sudden uh, things changed and uh, we got the INF Treaty. Well, first we got the meeting with Gorbachev and Reagan and they made a very important statement. They said, nuclear war must never be fought. Mm. Uh, nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. That, they're not saying that today. They're talking about actual nuclear right. war fighting. Right. And that's dangerous. And I would say the most number one requirement of our president is to keep us safe. And you can't keep us safe in an unlimited, uh, treaty-free uh, nuclear arms race. 
And it is not news. It's not being talked about. People are more Republicans want to talk about Trump and Republicans, I mean, the demos and Republicans. They don't want to talk about something else. So that would be number one. And if I had a number two, it would be climate change because that's just a slow-moving disaster. Um, uh, 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 the science is clear about it. I mean, this is 95. There's not a question here. 90, uh, I mean, there's always some uncertainty. But we're playing Russian roulette, both with the nuclear and with climate change. Mm. And make that turn extremely difficult, as witnessed by the loss of the uh, carbon tax in, uh, in, in Washington. So those are big. And then, you know, if you have some more time, you can talk about uh, artificial intelligence and cyber and uh, the growing inequality and a few odds and ends and things like that. Um, and I know there's other issues like free education and universal health care and immigration. But first, we've got to stay alive. <laughs> and then we can fight about some of these other things. But I like to take, I like to deal with the big stuff. And there's nothing bigger than annihilating the human race. Right. And by the way, those bombs, it doesn't take that many. It does not take, we got 7,000. Russia's got 7,000. Thousands are on alert, a few minute alerts. They're ready to push the button. So uh, yeah, I think it's real important. Putin, Trump, Xi, they ought to be talking. And it's not a bad thing to talk to the Russians. It's a good thing. And we used to talk to them a lot more. Mm -hmm. Nixon talked to them, Reagan talked to them. So uh, LBJ talked to me, he invited uh, the Russian uh, premier there, the Soviet premier. Um, so anyway, that, that's what I would say. I don't, want to, I don't want you to go home feeling bad, but, <laughs> but I don't want you to go home feeling confident. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I've been around, I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember how dangerous people were. By the way, I've attended meetings at uh, Stanford in the last, uh, in fact, the last two years, we've had meetings with retired Russian generals and retired American generals. And one of the retired Russian generals uh, was a colonel in, uh, on, in Cuba. And he had the nuclear armed uh, cannons, missiles, and he was empowered to fire it without going back uh, to Moscow. He had that power. And the Joint Chiefs of Staff and others told Kennedy, bomb Cuba. If he had bombed that emplacement and those missiles went off, we might have had the nuclear annihilation. At the same time, there was a submarine that was coming toward Cuba, and the American Navy was dropping uh, depth charges to make them surface, and they thought they were under attack. And the commander of the submarine said, fire. And they had nuclear weapons, and the president did not, or the CIA didn't know about those weapons. They didn't know about the ones on the island. They didn't know about the ones in the submarine. Mm -hmm. And the, the submarine commander said yes. And the political commissar on the, on the ship said yes. But there was a third man, the highest ranking political officer, and he said no. And that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. If they said yes, we probably would be no here. So this is real stuff. It's not uh, amenable to to mailings and micro-targeting, but it's the, it's the stuff that uh, statesmen are supposed to talk about. Okay. Particularly when we're getting so close to the 100th anniversary of World War I. Right. And World War I proved how well-educated, good Christians can do really stupid things. <laughs> and we're still paying for that, because the Middle East is, was drawn in such a way by the, by the, uh, by the uh, Versailles Treaty after World War I uh, that created Lebanon and Iraq and and um, Jordan and all this stuff, and we're still fighting over it. So uh, it is not true that a good Christian who's well-educated will do always the best thing. They may completely do completely stupid things. Mm -hmm. And since we're playing with such powerful toys, technologies, tools, we need even more wisdom than they even had 100 years ago. So the stakes are getting higher. And I like to put it this way. If you graph it, and you said, what is the graph of new technology and the power that human beings are creating. And that graph is going up. More and more power is being created by humankind all over the world. But then you might say, now let's graph wisdom <laughs> and restraint. And that's very flat. So you get these two curves, and uh, they get bigger and bigger. That's not a good thing. So we need some wisdom. We need some insight. 
and we need some dialogue because you got to talk. I want to talk about. I want to talk about some of the big things you did in California. But before we move on, I just want a bit of uh, uh, current events. Yeah. You served as Attorney General uh, to, uh, of California from 2007 to 2011. Our president today fired his Attorney General, Jeff Sessions. What's your view on that? Well, I was never a big Jeff Sessions supporter. <laughs> I think his, in fact, he came out to California and did something, I forget it, whether he was complaining about immigration, medical marijuana, or something we were doing that he didn't like. Um, but it, uh, first of all, the president's got a right to do what he wants to hire his own people, but it could be an ominous sign. And, um, you know, we need, uh, I think we'll find out, but it, I don't know, is this connected to the Mueller probe? I don't know that, but we'll, we'll find out. And, uh, I mean, there's a lot of people coming and going. The Secretary of State, uh, some of the other uh, other folks there. Um, uh, what's difficult? We are at a time of maximum and growing fragmentation. We need a president, along with congressional leaders, that look for some common ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending upon who's going to be next, well, he's got his acting guy. But it's just a little more of the turbulence, mm -hmm. and we're in a turbulent age. So, Gov uh, Governor Rolling Stone. But if he does. Uh, point a new person, I'd look, I'd rather have him come from California than Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anyone in mind? No. <laughs> no one that he would take. <laughs> Rolling Stone magazine wrote of you, Governor Brown remains a bundle of contradictions, a radical with a deeply conservative streak, a man who can decry the destruct destructive power of global capitalism while standing at the helm of the sixth largest economy in the world. He is grounded in politics as the art of the possible. How would you describe your political philosophy? Well, first of all, I want to say California is the fifth largest economy. <laughs> We've come up. As Rolling Stone. Yeah, but that was a year ago, <laughs> two years ago. No, we're, we're um, no, I, I'm, I'm not taking credit for that. California is what it is. It's Silicon Valley, it's agriculture, it's the movie industry, it's biotech, it's all sorts of things. Um, but uh, I have to say, I just want to say, because we're in Texas and you've got a pretty good growth rate here. Uh, but California, when I started, was two trillion in our wealth, GDP, gross domestic product. It's now approaching 2.8. So that means since I've been governor, um, there's eight, hundred billion sloshing around that wasn't there before. And that tends to make people feel good. <laughs> so You can slosh that around some Texas. Yeah. That makes it feel really good. Well, the only trouble is that go, what goes up goes down. We're in the longest recovery, and so we're probably headed for a recession pretty yeah. soon. Although the stock market went up today, so that was nice. Um, my political philosophy, um, you know, I don't know that I have a name for it. I, I coined the phrase when I ran for president in 1976. Um, I, uh, I took the name planetary realism. So planetary was supposed to be the visionary, thinking about the whole planet, whole earth, but realism was let's get real mm. and down to earth. So uh, I do think you gotta keep your eyes in the stars, but you have to keep your feet in the ground. And uh, uh, my training uh, has been uh, both innovative, because I'm living in California, and I went to Berkeley for a while, uh, but it's also traditional. I got my degree in Latin and Greek. I studied to be a Jesuit priest for almost four years. Um, and I've been around long enough to see a lot of changes. So I would say that um, I'm a realist, uh, but I also have a certain ideal or kind of missionary sense to try to... Um, change, try to make, make things better. And I enjoy making it. I enjoy, I won't want to just say I'm here to do good because I enjoy what I'm doing. So it's really for my own pleasure um, as well as others. But my philosophy is it's sometimes hard for people to get. And maybe that's because, see, I grew up in a mixed household. My mother was Protestant, my father was Catholic. So immediately there was division in who was right. And my grandmother, uh, on my father's side, was very anti-Catholic. 
She did not like the Catholic Church. She told me about that often. And when I was a little boy, I said, Grandma, you were going to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> but then as I learned uh, diversity and difference, uh, I got a, a more grounded sense. But I've had a very traditional uh, education and um, upbringing, very stable. When I grew up, San Francisco, the famous San Francisco, had a Republican mayor. Mm -hmm. California had a Republican governor. And uh, Eisenhower was, was president. So uh, there was a world in the 50s that looks very different than the world today. Mm -hmm. But I can appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that makes me in some ways uh, more conservative. But also, the older you get, you know, the fact is, you, uh, I have more past than future. So that already makes you a little on the conservative side. But I'm also <laughs> restless and uh, liking change and, and challenges. And, and I have uh, done some somewhat, you know, I've been pretty uh, unusual in terms of politics. And so I, I didn't get that Governor Moonbeam for nothing. Uh, <laughs> I proposed that California launch their own satellite uh, back in 78. Um, I won't get into all that, what happened to it, and what have you. But so I don't know what the... Uh, they do have a, uh, maybe the, to be more precise, in the world of political thinking, uh, they divide people sometimes between the realists, you know, the hard-boiled, you know, let's not get carried away with romance here. Um, let's take the world as it is and, and make it work. Henry Kissinger and um, uh, what's the name of the guy from uh, New York? He's dead now. Well, there's a, Mershammer is a guy at Chicago. So there's a whole group of these tough, hard-boiled characters. Then we have the idealists, uh, but some, they're also called liberal interventionists. Mm. And a lot of these people, they like the Iraq war. They're going to go around and save everybody. So somehow between being uh, someone who can work with the worst of the worst and being so caught up with your own romance that you're willing to kill people if they don't listen to you, um, I, I put myself in a, re a realist but with a lot of orientation from tradition um, and the kind of a classic uh, perspective on life. So whatever you can make of that. I, I don't like, I'm a liberal, but I don't like liberal interventionism where because you take and make such a big deal about human rights, you're ready to kill people about it. That was the argument. I heard a debate uh, on the Iraq war and um, this guy was very, Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens, who was a socialist mm. at one time. He was arguing for the, for the intervention, for the war. And he said this was George Bush's Hegelian moment. He could free the women of Iraq and create human rights and make democracy flourish. And he, he was quite a debater, but he was dead wrong. Mm. And we're still paying for that. Just the other day, they uncovered 200 uh, graves, mass graves from ISIS that took over in the aftermath of the turbulence and confusion in Iraq. So you need to be realistic, but you also have to have something that is, is value, fundamental, the fundamental uh, wisdom and, and right from wrong. I mean, you got to know that. So it, it's not, that's the way I put it. 28 years elapsed between your first terms as governor from 1975 to 1983 to your current uh, uh, tenure in office, which started in 2011. What lessons did you learn from that first stint as governor that you applied to your second? Well, I first applied that it's better to have a job than not. <laughs> and I'd rather be in office than out of office, at least for now. Um, so what lessons do you mean about lessons about... Uh, in terms of governing? Governing. Um, yeah, well, I think uh, as I see more, I get a more concrete sense of things. And um, a lot of politics is advocacy at a relatively high level of abstraction. And the, particularly when I became mayor of Oakland and you, you meet people who are afraid to come out at night because of the, uh, the criminals in the neighborhood, uh, you see people, I propose, the projects to bring development downtown and people protest. I created a military school and a former anti-Vietnam uh, war activist come and say that I want to militarize the youth of Oakland because I created a military school called the Oakland Military Institute, which still is running 15 years later, which is getting 98% of the kids into college. 
um, doing a very good job. So what I see from that is there's a lot of these uh, interests that, that make these cases, and you've got to, well, I don't care whether it's on the left, on the right, a banker, a union, an environmentalist, a farmer, you have to look very clearly what is at stake, what are they, what is, what's behind what's being said. So I would say uh, I have a much clearer eye about the issues. And um, I, I'm more, I, I, I did, I mean, if you read what I do, I do veto a lot of Democratic mm -hmm. bills. And uh, so, but I vetoed a few Democratic bills the first time, but I feel more confident mm -hmm. that I'm right. right. Uh, but so what did I learn? Well, I also learned that these demands are endless. I've reviewed, as governor, 16,000 pieces of legislation. I only vetoed five, eight percent of them, depending upon what the year was. So everybody's got a bill, and what's so amazing is the same problems that people were gonna solve in 1975, they're still solving today. Mm. So then you wonder, are we, are we solving problems or are we just enjoying solving problems without ever solving them? So, um, you know, it's our job not to solve problems, but to be in business as problem solvers. Think about that for a minute. Um, <laughs> so so I, I, I t I'd say I have a, a, a quicker eye, a clearer eye, and a, a, a kind of down to earth, uh, let's get real here. And I have to say, when I took over, uh, the deficit in California was 27 billion, and our debt, our short term debt, was about 30 billion. So I call it a mountain of debt. And I moved that all down, now we have a $16 billion surplus. I didn't, I mean, the, the economy, the farmers, the, uh, the, um, the um, Silicon Valley, the wealth, the wealth machine is incredible. Um, but uh, we can go over, you know, it's a cyclical thing. You've got a whole, there's no natural limit to what the legislature wants. Mm. So we have the Republicans who say no to a lot of things I think are good. And we have Democrats who only know how to say yes. Mm. So between the no's and the yes's, we have to find some balance here. And that's all. So um, that, that's what I've learned. And you can't, it's just amazing to me. Even I veto bills and they keep sending them to me. I have to veto them again. Um, so, I mean, uh, yeah. Because bills are wrapped, they have a nice name. You know, they always give it a name of something that um, makes it sound good. Obama had a program called Race to the Top. Well, who wants to race to the bottom? You know? <laughs> but I think it was a dumb program. And, <laughs> As governor of California, we didn't participate. We're the only state that didn't. And the reason I didn't, I thought it was trying to manipulate uh, teachers and schools from too far away. And I think at the end, we have to give more discretion to the teachers. They need some money, they need a decent salary, and they need the tools and the resources. So, but I'm just saying that, uh, so I've learned, I've, well, how can you not learn? I've done this job as my 16th year. I've heard every possible story. Uh, I've been lied to by experts. Uh, I've had people double cross me. I've had the most really good people double cross me. So that's a lesson, hmm. that even good people hmm. watch them. Yeah. <laughs> so, without getting cynical. Yeah. So that's, well, that's, a, that's a trick. To get, and I'm very enthusiastic and I'm very excited about all the good things that can be done but I don't have any illusions hmm. uh, of, how, of what the world really is. I want to go back to the economic miracle that you uh, pulled off in, in your home state leading to- California pulled off. I just happen to preside. I make the announcements, everyone else makes the money. Well, here's what, here's what Reuters wrote earlier this year. California Governor Jerry Brown appears poised to exit office next year with a top political priority in hand free from the massive budget deficits that had weighed on his predecessors. Buoyed by taxes, tax increases passed under his administration and a strong economy, Mr. Brown said that the state is projecting a $6.1 billion surplus for the next fiscal year. The United States currently has a total deficit of $21 trillion. Um, this year's deficit will be $779 billion, a 17% increase over last year. 
what are we doing wrong, and how do we, how do we, uh, how do we get it right? Well, first of all, you gotta get the politics right, and the politicians have to get right and get clear. Um, obviously, we're spending too damn much money and not on the right things, and they wanna spend more. Uh, they want massive trillion dollar nuclear arms build up. They wanna make them more flexible, more usable, uh, and they wanna spend a lot of money on that. And then we all wanna do all these things. If you look at the agenda, both Republican and Democrat, it exceeds what we're willing to pay in taxes. And that's a problem, and people are getting older. And the older you are, the more medical care you take. And we got Social Security. In California and many states, we have public pensions. So you, gotta, you have to deal with that. Uh, on pensions, I proposed a pension reform. I brought some litigation to try to make the, give the states and the cities more flexibility in adjusting pensions when um, hard times come. Uh, but I'd say it's very unrealistic. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the interest rates are gonna rise. Uh, the debt is rising. The needs are rising. Um, and, you know, if you look, just take, take one thing. Uh, China has built 5,000 miles of high-speed rail. Mm. The only high-speed rail we're building is in California right now. And it's not anywhere near that. And it's, it's still challenged. Uh, federal government has no infrastructure program. Uh, California had a, a $55 billion in deferred maintenance. Now under this uh, tax measure, we're gonna whittle that down. We have, we'll have 52 billion in 10 years. So you've gotta build, but you gotta pay for it. We used to have a slogan, not a slogan, a statement uh, 20 years ago, uh, you pay as you go. That's how you didn't build a road if you didn't have the money. You couldn't get the money unless you had a tax. And then they got this idea where we can borrow. You know, we'll have bonds. I think they called them, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger gave a name, economic recovery bond. It sounded great. $40 billion worth of debt, and it'll be there for 30 years, and we'll pay double. So um, I think this borrow, and here's a little thing. I know all the Republicans, they don't like taxes, but they love borrowing. Mm. They like bonds. They like debt. Look at the, uh, when you, were to, you hear all the rhetoric, the problems with China and Chinese are doing all that. Well, the tax cut was primary, it was not totally, but significantly financed by the Chinese borrowing, uh, buying our debt, mm -hmm. borrowing uh, treasury bills, treasury bonds. So we're going to, we, first we attacked the Chinese, I said, oh, by the way, will you please finance our debt because we want to give a corporate tax break. That does not make any sense. Uh, you gotta live, uh, I don't say we don't need to spend, we need to be spending more particularly on infrastructure. We have to curb, we want a medical care system, you gotta control the, uh, the pharma costs. You gotta control even the money that's flowing in the system. It's a great system, but it's twice as expensive as the system in Europe. And I wouldn't say it's twice as good. It doesn't cover as many people, uh, percentage-wise. And yes, there's some pretty amazing things, but you've got to uh, find a way, either through competition and controls, or both, um, to keep costs down. Just take one point. We, we're not allowed to buy drugs from Canada. Uh, we're not allowed to uh, publish uh, the prices that are being, uh, um, con concealment is, is the federal order. Mm. And Medi-Cal can't uh, negotiate. What would happen if Medicaid, rather? What if Medicaid and Medicare and a couple of big insurance companies decided we're gonna start negotiating? Well, they can't, they're not allowed to do that. Uh, so. Uh, you got to control costs. You have to invest and find new revenues. I'm not going to use the word taxes because I still am an elected office and you don't use that word. <laughs> but you, 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 get, you don't get something for nothing and you get what you pay for. And um, we all complain that the Chinese, you know, take, they took over the solar industry because they put a lot of money into it. And of course they artificially uh, and probably illegally lower the prices. But looking forward, Let's take the next car, in the next seven to 10 years, uh, very few people are gonna wanna buy anything but an electric car, mm -hmm. all right? It's gonna happen. They're cleaner, they're quieter. Um, they're, they're, in every way, it, it's, it's the future. One's like a horse and buggy, belching a lot of uh, toxic material out the tailpipe, the other isn't. Okay, so that's the way, I'm sorry, Texas, that's gonna happen. You're not gonna be, <laughs> be able to fill all our cars. By the way, I speak in a state that has 32 million vehicles that drive, that go, vehicle miles traveling, 350 
for, uh, 345 billion miles a year. So we're into this thing big time. However, when you look at what China has a goal, 2025, they want to dominate the auto, the battery. They want to be the masters of the battery. They want to have the patents, the technology, and the business. On the other hand, uh, President Trump uh, wants to roll back uh, the automobile standards that we have, the emission standards, which are very important in pushing us into cleaner vehicles and uh, zero emission vehicles, electric cars and hydrogen cars. So he is kind of working hand in glove because by making it less attractive to build the electric cars of the future by rolling back the existing rules and the Chinese are spending hundreds of billions in the R&D and they're requiring this. So they're going in an absolute opposite regulatory uh, direction and they're putting a lot of money behind it. So do we want to have a, a diminished, if at all, automobile industry in the next 10 to 15 years? Mm -hmm. You got to think out. It's not about four years. We're still, most of you will be around 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. So you got to think out and you have to be willing to, to uh, spend and invest and you got to bring the cost down. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just saying put on a hair shirt and uh, everybody cut their standard of living. But I do say we need much greater control on the costs. We need more competition where it doesn't exist. And we need research and investment uh, where it brings us uh, the technology and ways of the future. Governor, you just passed a law that will ensure that the boards of California-based publicly traded companies have at least one female board member, a number that will increase to three in 2021. And you said of the law, I don't minimize the potential flaws that indeed may prove fatal to its ultimate implementation. Nevertheless, recent events in Washington, D.C. and beyond make it crystal clear that many are not getting the message. Do you think this law will make a difference? Uh, well, I'll tell you, if I vetoed it, that would have made a difference. <laughs> so that's the way to put it. We either sign or we veto. Now, as the, the, the environment that we're in, all the stories, uh, the violence, the harassment that had become so um, public and manifest these last few years, uh, it just tells me that, you know, women are half the population. Why can't, well, I don't think it's that hard to do. Whether California can dictate to the rest of the country, that's a, a, a valid question whether that's true. But uh, what I said it never gets quoted in my message. I quoted the Supreme Court in the Santa Clara case from 1870 or whatever the hell it was, where they said, uh, corporations are persons. Mm. This is before women were given the right to vote. So by my Jesuit logic, I said, hey, if you could make corporations persons, why can't you put women on all the corporate boards of America? <laughs> that's a, that's a Talmudic logic, by the way. Uh, you will step down in January of next year? Yeah. What are you going to miss most about the job? What am I going to miss most? Uh, I don't, I, until I start missing it, I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. What am I going to miss? I mean, I'll miss nothing. I, don't, I, can't. I mean, I've done it for so damn long. <laughs> I, mean, I, I should have gotten it out of my system by now. So, I do like living in the governor's mansion, I have to tell you. That. Now that, you shouldn't say that, right? Because this is all about service. But... It's a hell of a nice mansion <laughs> that uh, 12 governors lived in. Ronald Reagan and Nancy lived there for a month. They moved out because they didn't like the neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> downtown, downtown Sacramento. So the next four or five governors didn't live there. And um, in fact, they, Nancy Reagan, just to give you a little color from California, she, when she was there, uh, 1967 to 1974, uh, she supervised the building of a new modern governor's, uh, governor's uh, mansion uh, out in the suburbs. It was too far away. It was kind of emblematic to go from the inner city to the suburbs. And, uh, uh, but when I was elected, uh, I didn't want to move in. And I called it a, a Taj Mahal. Um, 
I stigmatized. I was running on a very austere platform. I had a blue Plymouth. I got a little apartment. I paid my own rent. Had a modest mattress. So I was in the. I was in the kind on of the a, floor. No government. Yeah, well, it was on the floor. It was on a little box. It was on something. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, I like sleeping on the floor because then if you roll off in the middle of the night, you don't have as far to go. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so she. I refused to move into this mansion. It would have cost more if I lived there, and I had a little apartment. I was right across from the Capitol. I could walk to work. That was good. So anyway, uh, I made such a thing out of it that the next governor, after me, was a Republican. He wouldn't move in. And then by the time he left, they sold it. They invested the money. By the way, the money for this mansion came from the uh, political donors of Ronald Reagan. So these, this was his kitchen cabinet. They put up the money. So they sold the mansion. Uh, they put it in a fund. It earned good interest. So by the time I came along, they had a nice $4 million fund, and I went back to the old mansion and totally refurbished it, fixed it up, bought great chandeliers, great, my wife and I picked out the drapes, and it was lots of fun. And, um, and it was good, and 12 governors lived there. And it's, um, when I had to get the vote on the gas tax, I had the people there till two o'clock in the morning, and it has a certain aura to it. So it's functionally, uh, it's functionally productive, and it has nostalgia for me. My father, when he was there in 1959, uh, he would, in his bathrobe, go across the street to the, uh, uh, the mansion, what is it called, the, ma uh, the uh, mansion motel, I think. And my mother was very embarrassed because they had a pool over there. So she got his contributors to build uh, a pool, which we still have, and his children um, swam in it, his grandchildren. And now his great-grandchildren get to swim in the pool. And that's a minor thing. That is not greatly in the public interest, but it's kind of a, it's kind, it's a kind of a neat thing. Uh, but I will tell you, walking down the stairway, uh, being up the third floor, which is the old ballroom, knowing that Earl Warren spent 10 years there with his family, uh, Lincoln Steffens, the great muckraker around the turn of the century, he, uh, he owned it before the state bought it. It has a tradition to it. And it gives a certain solemnity and weight to the discussions mm. that take place there. And I've invited legislators um, and, and all sorts of other people. John Kennedy came there and had breakfast in the breakfast room, um, which we use quite frequently. And uh, I was talking to my father when he ran for president. This was when he was a senator. Um, Indira Gandhi came out there. So there's pictures, there's stories. Um, it has a life. Mm. And, Everything is not disruption and change. There has to be continuity, um, rootedness, and memory. Uh, and that's also part of who we are as a people, uh, where we've come from. So it isn't the White House, uh, but it's better than uh, what some of the other governors uh, chose in the intervening period. So I like that. I, uh, but what will I miss? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I'm only moving uh, an hour away uh, to a ranch that my uh, great-grandfather started in 1878. And he was very smart because it was a dollar an acre. And I got 2,500 of them, so I'm very happy. And he was a German who couldn't speak English, but he knew how to, he knew how to lend money to people and take their land when they didn't pay them back. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this is a stagecoach stop. So I feel I'm very grounded in the history of California and a place that is so innovative and everything is disruption, change, Uber, and all the rest of this stuff. Okay, good. But you also have to have a past, a structure, um, an idea. What is the idea of California, the idea of America? And uh, that is very important because that what is what can unify us because uh, we can be a part of something more generic, something more general, as opposed to these smaller uh, loyalties and identities that are pulling the country apart. Uh, the governor mentioned his wife, Anne, and I should mention to you that uh, we got a California two for tonight. Not only did we get Governor Brown, but his wife, Anne, is here, and we're honored to have you as well, Anne. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> governor, we have a number of students in the audience from the LBJ School of Public Affairs, and you have spent uh, your life devoted 
to serving the public. What advice would you give these young folks? What advice? Well, if you want to get into politics, get in politics. You have to go work for somebody. Work for a, a senator or a local uh, official or maybe a think tank or um, get in a campaign. The uh, campaigns are among the most open um, pathways uh, of employment that you can imagine. I, I think my wife was, was shocked when we were talking about my campaign in 2010, you know, who are we going to hire? Well, we don't go to a recruitment firm. I said, we just opened this headquarters and people are going to start coming in the door. And they did. And you find good people. So you can actually go into a campaign and if you're good at writing, uh, better if you're good at fundraising, uh, if you have any organizing ability or functioning, if you got the time, that's a place to start in, in campaigns. And I've met a lot of people that way since I've had a lot of campaigns. Mm. I mean, <laughs> I've been campaigning a lot. You know, <laughs> my father started, ran for district attorney of the city of San Francisco in 1939 when I was one. I didn't know about that campaign. But he lost, and he ran four years later, 1943, and I remember that uh, very well. Um, he handed out little cards that said, crack down on crime, pick brown this time. And I, was, I used that in my campaign for attorney general. It worked. Um, but so every four years, uh, my father was on the ballot until Reagan beat him in 66. And then after four years later, I was on the ballot running for secretary of state, and I ran as long as I could. And then in 1982, I had to take a slight um, sabbatical, extended sabbatical, and then I came back. So uh, I can tell you, campaigns are worth being a part of or working in maybe political offices or maybe in a more policy-oriented way that uh, the school of public policy is a way to both study at and maybe uh, be a part of in some way. So I think there's a lot of entry points at which you could realize your, your political dreams. Governor, you've had uh, uh, a remarkable career. Congratulations on uh, uh, ending your remarkable tenure as the governor of California. And uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's been a great honor having you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.